The original Xbox came out in 2001, and people quickly figured out how to double its stock 64 megabytes of RAM. Microsoft revised the console over the years, with the last revision being 1.6, and this one removed the spare RAM footprints. Due to this fact, people always said online that it wasn't possible to upgrade the 1.6 to the double amount, 128 megabytes. The problem is, I have a 1.6, and I'm not taking no for an answer. So I'll be showing my process in this video on how I became the first person to upgrade the 1.6 to 128 megabytes. Here I have Xblast uh, flashed onto my X3. This is the 1.6, and uh, well, I've already completed this mod, so it does say up there 128 megabytes. And of course, this is the BIOS that I modified, so now the test does appear in this menu, and I've already completed the mod, so it does pass. But when I first activated this, then the test pretty much ended immediately, because it detects the error and then just uh, ignores. So it would just say failed, 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 failed. My idea was that I could either stack the additional RAM chips on top of the existing ones or run lots of wires to connect up the additional chips. The first step is research. Let's try to prove to ourselves that this is possible. Essentially, I want a deeper understanding of the system first. I found these awesome scans online of the 1.1 and 1.6 motherboards from sick mods, and this was my main point of research. Here on the 1.1 motherboard, you can see these four RAM footprints on the top side. If I flip it over, then you have four RAM footprints in the same positions underneath. When I add these numbers, which I've put one to four, being the stock RAM, and five to eight being the additional RAM, then you can see uh, these two chips here are the stock ones, and these two are the additional ones on the top side. Going to the bottom side, then these two are the stock chips, and these two are the additional chips. Taking a look at the 1.6 motherboard, this motherboard is very easy to spot by these missing footprints. But underneath the missing footprint is a valid footprint. As we just saw, it's the same layout uh, on the 1.1 motherboard. So my question is, are enough signals shared by each one of these chips that I can just stack a chip right on top of it and most of the pins match? Because that would make for a rather easy modification. Now, overlaying the chip pinout on top of the board, uh, I can start looking at these signals and see what they're doing. In this case, I'm looking here at the stock footprint on the bottom side, and all I want to do is compare those signals and see where they go on the top side. Let's just take an example and trace this BA0 pin. This is the least significant pin of the bank address. There are two of these pins, so there are four banks within the RAM chip. So I hide the pin out, then I can start drawing this. It drops down to a via here, so now I'll go to the other side of the board. Very conveniently, Microsoft put pretty much all of the signal traces on the outside layers of the board and just left power to be on the inside layers of the board. So now on the other side, we're on the bottom side, we can see that goes to this pad here. And the other via Well, that one just goes off somewhere to the North Bridge or the GPU. It's in the same package. So what's going on here? It seems to be going from one pin on the left side to the same pin on the right side. And this makes complete sense because the pin out that I have here overlaid is for the top side. And this pin on the top side will be the same pin on the other side on the bottom side, it's flipped, right? So this is actually just connecting BA0 to BA0. 
the pin is shared between both chips. As part of my research, I just went around and looked at all of these pins and I traced them out and I checked which ones match just like BA0 to the chip underneath. Now I've gone ahead and marked all of those pins that do match to the chip below with the green little tick. So you can go around and pretty much observe that all of the DQ pins are not matching and all of the others are matching. There is one exception, the chip select. This is pretty obvious, right? If it's a chip that is sharing every signal, then if it was sharing the chip select, it would also be communicating at the same time. You know, it would be outputting and inputting the data at the same time. Then you just have two chips that are operating at the exact same time with the same data. And it's useless, it's pointless. You're just wasting power. So the chip select allows each chip to be selected independently of the other. Here's the data sheet for a similar RAM chip, and it explicitly says that the CS pin can be used for selection between devices in parallel. An interesting thing to note is that it doesn't explicitly disable the outputs, only the command inputs. Then we come to the DQ pins. So this is really interesting. These pins are not connected to the one on the opposite side, they're actually connected to the same pin on the same side. So let's take DQ3. We can see that it goes over to this fire right here. Now I flip to the bottom side, it comes out of that fire and into the same pin. But it's not the same pin, it's flipped. That's actually DQ28. So it seems like the data is just reversed for the chip below. This wouldn't make sense if it wasn't for an interesting property of memory chips, which is that addressing and the order of data bits really doesn't matter because all that matters is that the processor sends out a stream of bits all at once. And when it reads back the same address, then it gets back all of those bits in the same state. So the ordering doesn't matter. Consider this example. The CPU's bits zero to seven are scrambled by the wiring connecting to the RAM. But then that same wiring automatically descrambles them back to the CPU. At this point, I am pretty confident that I can do this mod, but it hinges on one thing, and that is this chip select pin. If I cannot find this chip select signal on the 1.6 motherboard, then there's nothing I can do. It's possible that the GPU Northbridge doesn't even support this anymore. They could have removed the pin entirely because it's a different silicon revision. So that's when I went ahead and started tracing these chip select pins. My idea was that I can trace back the chip select pin Let's take this one. This one's on the bottom side. And I can trace this back to the GPU following this wire. It drops down to this wire. And there's the pad on the north bridge on the top side. Now, what if I choose that same pad on the 1.6 and see what that goes to? Here's the 1.6 motherboard, and you can see per my annotation, it just immediately goes to a fire. Switching to the bottom side, that fire is there, but it doesn't connect to anything. This doesn't necessarily mean that I would be able to do the project at that point, because this fire could be connecting to some internal signal, or even internally connected to ground. Uh, there are many things that could be wrong. So then I know at least I have this signal. I can probe it. You know, it exists on the bottom side of the board. If this via wasn't here, I would say there's no way anyone would do this mod unless they were crazy. Now, switching over to the software side of things, I have the Xblast OS BIOS utility checked out here. The whole source code was available 
just on Bitbucket, so that was very convenient. And I'm going to need to make a modification because this BIOS has a 128 megabyte RAM test, which is going to be very helpful to me. The menu item for this test does not appear on a 1.6 console. The creators of this BIOS did not think it would ever be possible. So there you go. Um, and I think the most direct way to find this is just going to be to search for that text as it appears on the screen. Or even just 128 megabytes, because right there it is. Or this is, um, this is actually the display code for the test page itself. So, whereas this, yes, here it is. This is in tools menu in it. And uh, yeah, it's in the tools menu. And here's the logic. If get motherboard revision is not equal to 1.6, then show the item in the menu. And, uh, and there's the logic behind it. So modifying this is as simple as that, just to enable the test to run on my Xbox at all. But we're going to need to take it one step more than this because I'm on a journey here to prove that I can do this first. So we need to prove that those chip select points are even doing what I want them to do. So let's go ahead and look at the test itself. So this goes to mem test. Where is that? That's down here. And mem test calls test bank. Here it is. Here it is below. To understand this code, let's look at how memory is logically arranged in the Xbox. On the top, we have the word number. A word here is 32 bits or 4 bytes. The code uses a pointer to a 32 bit integer, so this makes it easier to understand. Words 0 to 3 are accessed from bank 0, the next 4 are from bank 1, and so on, up to bank 3. At word 16, the process repeats from bank 0 again and this pattern repeats throughout the whole 64 megabyte space. The low level reason that it's organized into groups of four like this is that the memory is set up with a burst length of four. That means that any access, even if you want just one byte, will transfer 16 bytes internally. Xblast's RAM test uses this knowledge to reduce the test time by only testing three out of the four words per group. This method still tests both address bits that cover each group. Now that we know the memory layout, this function is pretty obvious. It tests one bank at a time, starting from the 64 megabyte mark. Starting from the value 1, it fills up the memory bank, excluding the fourth word that we just covered. Then it reads back the values, checks they're all matching the value, then changes the value and repeats the process. Throughout each loop, the value is doubled to test the next bit along. As soon as any error is detected, the test quits. When all the 32 bits of the word have been tested, the test finishes and gives a success result. If I run this on my Xbox, the result is obvious. It's just going to tell me that all the banks fail, because that memory is not installed. What I want to do is devise a test, a similar test, that is just going to help me see uh, the signals that I want to see. To let me see each bank of the device being uh, selected and deselected, what I've done is expanded this uh, test procedure here uh, so that it goes through all eight banks. Those would be the four lower banks and the four extended banks each. Um, four banks being 64 megabytes. Now the test bank accepts uh, values greater than four. Uh, previously it was zero to three. Now it's uh, zero to seven. So those uh, upper numbers now refer to the upper 64. Um, and I've changed this loop so that it only reads. Um, previously it would be writing and then reading back. But uh, we can't write here because this would overwrite everything. And uh, this code actually exists in RAM. So we can't overwrite that. It would not work at all. But reading will be just enough to uh, see on the scope just fine. All right, so here's the setup. This is my 1.3. 
but I've just switched to this one because uh, it's going to be easier to show. Um, for a start, it still has the 64 megabytes, uh, and it's a lot easier to access those signals on the top side. So I have four of those broken out to these scope probes here. Uh, they are the chip selects of the four chips that are on top. And as XBlast is running, you can see two of those have got some activity. Let's uh, have a go and see what my custom RAM test does. I go down to tools and run the test. Now it's functionally useless as a test now, but it's going to allow us to see something interesting. So this is bank one, bank two, bank three. This is in the lower 64, bank four, bank five, bank six, bank seven, bank eight. And the test has ended. So those all failed. Um, but what we really saw was the success. So you saw uh, this one was activating solidly, then this, and there was this, then this. So what that said to me was, when I saw it on my 1.6, uh, it said to me that those signals were operating just like a chip select. And um, the only thing that confused me was how the signals were behaving. Uh, but it really makes sense. So if you look at these two signals right now, then it's the bottom two that are active. So what's going on here is it's just the uh, GPU accessing whatever it needs to display this screen. But paradoxically, the two ones that are active belong to the extended memory. So we trace those, uh, what's that dark blue and purple? So it's this one and, and this one. So I trace that wire, then that wire goes over to this empty footprint. There's no RAM there. But despite there being no RAM there, it's the most active signal. But when I thought about this, it made more sense. So if you look at the other two signals, then they're just solidly low, right? And low it means selected, whereas the other signals are going high, uh, like some of the time. They are transitioning high. Uh, so this means they're being deselected. So in fact, it makes sense, right? The chip that doesn't exist is being deselected. Uh, same for this one. Whereas the chips that do exist are being selected. So when I saw this result, I knew that it was possible. Um, and that's when I ordered my chips, made the tutorial, uh, became famous, uh, ruled the world and such. Not included in this video is any tutorial on how to do this mod to your own Xbox. I recommend you watch Macho and Nacho's tutorial on this mod or read my original forum post. That said, thanks to Tito for the shout out and thank you for watching.